I think that's a really, really great transition point for what we want to talk about next. So um, we talk about how he's going to be linking up with other polls, right? So you got Carol Swiderski in that team who is uh, currently lighting up uh, Charlotte FC. He's their, their main point of attack, doing super, super well. But you have other Polish players in the league itself who are doing kind of the same thing, trying to make that next step up. Um, you've got Patrick Klamala playing at New York Red Bull, my club. He's my starting striker. Um, Kasper Shabilko, same deal. He, uh, he starts next to Swiderski, I believe, when, uh, when Lewandowski is not in that side. Um, a lot of them have that same build of wanting to try and take that next step. Uh, and this is something that we've been trying to talk about with somebody who, who kind of oversees uh, or has a team overseas or is from overseas. And, and that is what type of image does MLS have uh, to the overseas football community. I know you you say you're you're based kind of out of the U.S., but you have a lot of ties back there. If you could share kind of just something along those lines of how they see it, because we've been trying to do this thing where we advocate the fact that it has been a league of great change over the past five years or so, where it's so much less about people coming to retire and more about kind of like what you said, young players coming in to make a name for themselves to make that move over. Um, is that is that narrative being displayed over overseas at all? Yeah, I think I think it is. I think the narrative is changing slowly and surely. I think you're always going to have your band of people that believe it's a retirement league, just because of the sole fact that it's it's a newer league and and you know they probably don't study the MLS so closely, so they only see really when the big names Pirlo, Lampard, Ibrahimovic, Gerard, Ashley Cole. You know they kind of churn on over and you're like yeah all those guys are old it's a retirement league um you know kaka was one of them nani's also there as well um but i do think that you know when you look at mls you know like you said the league's changed tremendously over the past 10 or 15 years when you look back at the watershed moment of the david beckham signing and the designated player rule and how uh, financially financially close mls came to folding before david beckham you know, I think it's made a tremendous leaps and bounds. When you look at some of the, the past um, expansions, like Chivas USA, which was just a half-cocked, half-brained idea, that failed. Um, you know, you had two teams that folded in Miami, Miami, Miami Fusion and Tampa Bay Mutiny. You know, it had kind of silly nicknames. You had, um, you know, obviously the New York, New Jersey Metro Stars. That's just a mouthful. Obviously, they're now, you know, Red Bull New York and whatever. So, you know, the, it is a league of change. I think the way that they're going into markets is really smart. Now, when you look at Austin, when you look at um, Atlanta as a, as a marquee one, Minnesota is a good, good place to play. Portland and Seattle have amazing fan bases. Uh, Charlotte, you know, highest, highest, uh, second highest grossing um, uh, turnout for their uh, attendance for their, for their first ever game next to the FA cup, uh, the, the league cup final at, at Wembley. You know, it's an incredible thing. And I think there's so much talent on show. And I think what you're starting to see now is you're starting to see a flux of players leave MLS to Europe. Um, in some respects, that's really, really good because it's growing not only the, the, you know, the men's team and the game, they're going out to Europe to be ambassadors for the league, uh, the show that they can play. But you're also, you know, losing that talent that you want to keep in MLS. So I think in some respects, MLS is maybe losing its losing its moniker as a retirement league and more as like a selling league because at the end of the day, the salary caps are going to limit what a player can earn in their growing potential. And if I'm a potential player and I'm doing okay for DC United, or I'm doing well for whatever, I mean, you look at Paredes at DC United, he went to Wolfsburg. Why? Because Wolfsburg gets the Bundesliga. They're paying more money. And what do you want to do? Be stuck on a, des a regular salary at DC United, maybe making 60, $65,000 a year. Or do you want to go and get paid the life changing, life changing money um, to go out there and do that. So I think, you know, that's something the MLS probably needs to address. They've tried to address it with the designated player rule. There's a lot of rehash with that with the NSL. And I could talk to you about the NSL and the nauseum because I studied it extensively for both my undergrad and my master's. But, you know, I think it's got a, it's got a phenomenal rep. I think it's, I think it's growing in reputation. And I think uniquely Darby has a very unique uh, and very exciting tie to the MLS because several several players have come from the MLS um, either from Derby to the MLS or from the MLS to Derby so we're one of the few clubs in England that has a great amount of players that have transformed transferred between the leagues so I think it's growing in reputation I think there's still a lot to be done but at the end of the day um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's losing its moniker, I think in some, in some aspects, but then there's sometimes that they just don't because there's some people that are just not as educated about it, right? You guys follow MLS week in and week out. You can see what's coming through. You can see the, the player transactions that are happening between these leagues. But then I think for, for people in England that get maybe the one occasional game, you know, and then they sit there and they go, oh, this league, this league's crap. But to be fair, I can watch a lot of champions, championship games. And a lot of those games are crap as well. You know, like Huddersfield versus Luton, you're watching it and you're like, I watched a game. It was Luton Town versus Peterborough. And I'm like, if this was Austin versus Nashville, I would turn this off. But I'm not not to be disrespectful to those teams. But you see, because if because you look at because you look at the teams that are playing, you don't look at the standard of the play that's going on. You know, you look at a Bundesliga game and it's Freiburg versus Augsburg. You'd be like, oh, watch that. Bundesliga. That's all right. But if it was if the same if the players were putting on MLS kits and it was inner Miami versus Kansas City Wizards, you'd be like sorry, sporting Kansas city would be like, Oh, I'm turning this off. This is just an MLS game. This is just poor, but it's, it's those team names. So I think MLS is doing a good job and it's growing. And I think, you know, they're starting to get a following in, in the UK. There's a couple of podcasts that, that do them from the UK um, and things like that, but you're always going to get those people that think it's the retirement league. And, and with good reason though, because the financial, the financial barriers are in there for a reason because you don't want it to fail like NSAL did. Um, but I think it's growing. I think there's a lot of talent there. And I think it's an untapped market for a lot of these teams. And I wish Darby in a way would look at some of these players because you could get them for virtually no money in terms of wages and, and, a, and a transfer fee, hypothetically in the football economy speaking, not sure. for you and Connor, that would be a lot of money, but right. You, know, uh, you go out there and I think there's a, there's an opportunity to sign players that, that could do well and then have uh, sell on value as well. I, I think that's first off, Kansas City Wizards is a name I wish we brought back because that I haven't heard that in years and that was phenomenal. Um, but I really like how you how you mentioned that where we are losing that moniker. But I still think personally, and we've talked about this a lot on some of our other episodes, that there is a there's a a, a little bit more time before we can make that jump into what the world market is like. You mentioned because you don't want to fail like the NASL and. We talk about how if we were to do, you know, pro rel is something we can dive into forever. But if we were to jump into pro rel right now, you've got teams like Chicago Fire who are bringing in seven thousand fans a game. You take away their professional status, and they fold, right? Well, there'd be there'd be teams that would go down and they never come back up, and then you're expecting someone like Richmond Kickers, let's say, or Charleston Battery to come up and play in the MLS, and they're sitting in like college stadiums, or they're sitting in, um you know, uh, like minor league baseball stadiums. I mean, there's a, a former Derby County player who played for DC United, John Harks. He's the sporting director and coach at Greenville Triumph. We talked to John Harks, we, you know, Greenville Triumph are doing amazingly well, right? If they, if they were to get promoted, even to USL League One, the infrastructure is not there. So, I mean, pro relegation, I think, eventually has to happen because that's what draws, that's the different draw for American fans in, into that, right? It's something different. When you first started learning about the game, you're like, what do you mean if you're crap, you can go down? Like, they could do it in baseball, right? Because some of the AAA stadiums and the major league stadiums, you know, the teams, the teams would be level possibly, but the stadiums and the infrastructure, like no one, no one wants to go to Charleston Battery for an MLS game. It's just not going to happen. So you have to, you have to bridge that gap. You have to raise that infrastructure. And so, yeah, I mean, it's something that needs to happen, but, you know, I think you're right. It, it's, it's a few years off right now. And I, I know MLS has done like their next, this like next gen kind of developmental league, which is kind of like a second tier that was a little disappointing because you'd think maybe we could work with the USL to develop. I mean, Richmond kickers in Charleston that have been around for 20 odd years, you know, they've, they've been around as long as MLS. Um, and those are just two of the, you know, the, the river dogs and all that stuff. They're just a couple of the teams that I know. So you just feel like they could work better with USL and bring them into that conversation and maybe make that like an MLS and slowly start to build that up. But some of these MLS teams would go down and never come back up. Like, the Chicago fire. And I think the thing is, is like, you got to get out of the mindset of having these, these, these clubs as franchises. Yeah. You know, the Derby County is a football club. It was 1884 founder member of the football league used to be a baseball team and a cricket team, but it kind of feels like sometimes they're franchises and when they're franchises has a different kind of feel. So I think they're doing really well. When you look at the community building that LAFC did when they started out, you look at the, the, the uh, Pacific Northwest there with Vancouver and Portland and Seattle you know, there, there's a lot of great, um, a lot of great history there that they can capitalize on uh, in terms of things like that. So, yeah, I think pro relegation definitely, definitely for that definitely needs to happen, but they have to, they have to make sure that they get the infrastructure and do it right. Because if you make, if you screw it up, 
you'll lose everything that you built over 25 odd years in the MLS if you get it wrong. So it needs to be done right. And you need to make sure that the infrastructure is there, but MLS can only do that if they help themselves and, and invest in the game at lower levels. Thank you.